Well, good morning. <clears throat> Happy to see you all. Welcome to those of you online and those of you in person. My name's Ross. I'm one of the pastors here, and today I get the honor and the privilege to walk you through a portion of God's Word as we're going through our series called the Sermon on the Mount, uh, Upside Down Kingdom, and how Jesus begins to lay out a path in which we may follow uh, to live under his rule, his command, uh, for his purposes and his way in which he had created us to live. And so we see this unique uh, moment of Jesus speaking to us. Now let me, before I get any further, I need to uh, just be honest before you. Um, and like every week, <clears throat> for any of our pastors, Marty, Mark, myself, um, that are preaching, or any of our staff members, you know, we don't have everything perfect at all, or anything. We aren't these examples that say, you know, come do it like I've done it perfectly. But yet we're able to, and especially today, um, submit together to the Word of God and walking uniquely together through what it might look to follow Him, uh, and, and especially today in a really tough way, uh, in the way that, you know, requires our treasure, our, our treasures and maybe our greatest treasures, we think, that requires our full trust. And today I stand before you as someone who is on a journey with you, uh, like every week, I hope you would know, that doesn't have these things perfected, but yet with you and together we can grow to be more like Christ. Because today I believe Jesus really wants to show us and help us understand that he's calling us to this undivided allegiance to God in his kingdom. And by that allegiance, by the way in which we live fully for him, as him our first pursuit, we then walk into the ways in which he challenges us and allows us to be generous with the things we have, and then also <clears throat> shows us in the way in which we can trust him with everything we have and everything we know, everyone we know. And so I trust this morning that he may uh, illuminate our hearts as we walk through his word together in unity and growing to be more like him and growing to understand where he's calling us and commanding us to take step. And so we're going to be in Matthew 6, 19 through 34. Today we're going to look at our treasures, both our earthly ones, how we can grow uh, in heavenly treasures, and then also look at the worries, anxieties in our life, and how we might combat those. And so I'm going to read the passage in full right now. I'm going to pray, and we're going to dive in. If you're taking notes with us, I have some points along the way that you can take notes and follow along. But here we go. Matthew 6, 19 says this, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy, and where th thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourself treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you eat or you drink, or about your body, what you wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away any in barns, store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all those things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has, a, has enough trouble of its own. <clears throat> Let's pray. Father, thank you for the moment we get to step in and walk through your word. And I pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, God, that is within us, uh, among us here, present with us here, God, that you would uh, convict us, show us the way in which it looks to live righteously for you, and to take steps with you to grow in relationship, to grow in, in the way we walk here on earth. Uh, God, I pray that you would um, give us a divine appointment just with you as we walk through your word. And I thank you that you will and that you'll speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. 
In 1995, a group of friends, and they're some really cool friends, they went on this journey, and they've been going on journeys from 95 to probably now or a little later, I don't really know. <clears throat> but throughout this, these group of friends have these crazy ups and downs and trials and hardships, and you can only imagine the things that they would go through throughout their entire lifespan. Um, and in this process, there's these moments where these trials and hardships really try to separate them. They misunderstand each other. Uh, they're growing to know each other a little better each and every step of the way. And so in, the, in these hardships, we find that they have this renowned, like really powerful loyalty and undivided just a uh, commitment to one another. Uh, they, through any of these hardships, they're, they're just unbreakable. And as like Woody and Buzz and uh, all these people, they, they just come together and they really break stride in the way that they care for one another and they're with each other and they're undividedly allegiant to what is their friendship and the way in which they can walk through life. Now, these are the characters of Toy Story, and there's many more that I didn't choose to memorize for this morning. But all in all, these are, this is a, a movie you can watch, Toy Story, all those movies, and um, they're these toys that become awake whenever Andy, the owner, is, not, is gone. And thankfully, that doesn't happen in our world. You know, like in reality, thankfully, it's just like, uh, you know, um, just, you know, created by our minds to think, what if toys spoke? What if they lived a life? What if they went on journeys and adventures? But in, in, in the latter, they're like that unique, undivided loyalty and allegiance they had for one another, right? When Woody and Buzz are trying to figure out their relationship, their friendship, and they clash and they walk away from each other, they realize in the depths of their being, man, I love that guy and we're friends. And I want to lay my life down to make sure they're okay. And then they come back together. There's all that tension and story, right, throughout each of these movies, which shows us this, this allegiance, this loyalty in which they would have. And the similar is true for us as we follow Jesus, that Jesus not only comes to earth and lives a life, a perfect example of a life, sinless in his fullness of nature, climbs on a cross, dies for me and your sins, but yet calls us to an allegiance, to a loyalty, to a fullness that we are to submit to him and walk with him and look to him first and foremost above everything that is unbreakable, undividable, that he is calling us to a loyalty, allegiance that is deeper than that of Toy Story. They're just toys, okay? That was just an, an illustration. Deeper than maybe some of the friendships you have, but yet through the hardships and trials and circumstances and moments in time, he's calling you to a loyalty allegiance with him that would be undivided. And through that, I believe today, he'll lead us to uh, grow and living generously and completely trust in him for all of our needs. So first point for today is undivided allegiance. As God calls us his undivided allegiance within our life, that we would loyally, under his command and role, live for him first and foremost, we must start kind of at the end of our passage today to help illuminate that. In Matthew 6, we're going to go there. There's this phrase Jesus uses right after talking of worries, which I believe shows this undivided loyalty, allegiance to what he's calling us to, commanding us to, in order to further walk with him through the few things we'll talk about today. And it says this, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Undivided allegiance, unbroken loyalty, full devotion is to seek God and his kingdom first and foremost in our lives as a whole. And you might be wondering, like, what does it look like to actually seek God and his kingdom and his righteousness? Naturally, like, what does that look like? Is it a road I can take in Dubuque? Is it a giant hill somewhere that I need to hike up? No, by no means. But in your daily walk, as you walk with him, as you, as you are following after Jesus, as you're connecting with him each and every day, that you would make an allegiant declaration at the beginning of each of your days to say, God, I want to seek you first above anything else that happens today. I want to chase after your rule for my life and obey your command in which you call me to live and let that assign my priority before I set anything else below that for the day. And if those things don't align with you, I can't do them because I'm allegiant and called in full loyalty undivided to you, God, seeking you first. See, this statement by Jesus mixed into this passage so beautifully that he illuminates the reality of this undivided loyalty in which he's calling us to, to seek first. 
And we think of it in a, a way of like maybe a, a race, if you're into racing or, or something like that. If, if you're to come first, there's nothing before them. They're first, right? If someone were to come second, you wouldn't call them first. If they were truly second, they're second. And third, fourth, fifth, sixth, right? Sometimes we can misunderstand that when, when, when God calls us to seek him first, we sometimes want to wrestle with, and we'll see in the passage, to put things near first or a little above, well, well God said seek him first, but like, I got to do this really important thing right now, and so I'm going to meet this up here a little bit. It can be kind of first-ish. And God's like, no, 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 not that. Seek first my kingdom, the righteousness in which I call you to. Seek first me. And later it says, I'll also be given. We'll see the context in which he's meaning that. And I think naturally, just last week as we walked through the disciplines with Pastor Mark, and we see this Lord's Prayer, and it begins, right? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And if we think about it and say it quickly, it can't resonate the reality of what it's saying. It's calling to full allegiance, allegiance to God's will and his way above our own. It doesn't say, God, let my will and my way happen in that prayer. It says, God, may your will and your way happen on earth as it is in heaven. We see Jesus in this unique interaction before he goes to the cross. Come and say, God, if you can take this cup from me, but yet your will, your way. He even submits to the Father in this uniqueness of way. And so it's incredibly encouraging that Jesus and himself teaching us to do the same is the prime example of the one to do it before us. That we are to seek his will, his righteousness first and foremost, and all else will be given to you. It's almost like don't even worry about what's next. If you seek me, you're on the right path. Now if we go back to the beginning of our passage, with that context in mind of seeking him first, we can begin to further understand in what ways we need to seek him above other pursuits in our life. And that comes in Matthew 6, 19. We're going to start at the beginning of the passage. He talks on treasures, money. He says this, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So Jesus is beginning to explain two ways to store up treasures. And these two opposing ways, which we get to at the, near the end of this passage, this reality that you can't serve both. One must reign supreme above the other. And so in these two ways, he says this very explicitly. Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth, for they are temporary, right? We, we know that, we feel that, yet we wrestle with that. But store up heavenly treasures, <clears throat> and what, what would that be? I mean, like, we think of the next phrase, for where your treasure is, your heart is. See, what you treasure today shows where your heart's truly at. And in this reality of him encouraging us to store up heavenly treasures, we must identify some of what those are. And maybe we need to take just a moment and um, <clears throat> look at a, a parable specifically on what that could look like and how those riches in which we seek after for God would, would come to fruition. So it says here in Luke 12, this is a parable, so it's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning that Jesus brings to illuminate to us this, this idea. It says this in Luke 12, and he told this parable, the ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what should I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he says, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns, and build bigger ones, and there I will store my surplus of grain. This is Luke 12, verse 19 now. He says this, and I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. Verse 20, but God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. So in this parable, Jesus is, <clears throat> in parallel, explaining this way in which we store up things on earth and opposed to heaven. And, and in this reality, this guy, right, he, he, he yielded this great uh, abundant harvest. And his first thought isn't necessarily for God, isn't necessarily for what he can do with it to bless others, but his first thought is what? I must build bigger barns, right? to store up all this grain. And then the scriptures literally says, and he sits back and says to himself, you have plenty. 
Just eat, drink, and be merry. I'm good. And have you ever found yourself talking to yourself like that? Do you ever talk to yourself in that way? You know, I'm picturing this guy in his big barn with all his grain, whatever that looks like, you know. Or maybe before that, he's just sitting in his, like, rocking chair or whatever they used to sit in. And they're just like, man, you have much. You should just drink, eat, and be merry, right? It's easy to look past that, but we do talk to ourselves in that way. Maybe not vocally, out loud, but, you know, you can catch me when Noel and the kids, my wife, and our three kids are maybe out on a walk that I, I was doing something I couldn't go or chose not to go for some reason, and they leave, and I'm like, man, I'm going to eat my favorite snack that my kids can't steal. I'm going to sit in my favorite chair that they're not going to climb on me. I'm going to watch my favorite sports team that they cannot interrupt, right? Like, we talk like that almost out loud sometimes. I mean, like, I, I'll confess I would do that. Like, they're out the door, and, and thank you, Noel, for doing that from time to time. Not, I mean, not crazy often, but maybe more often. No, just kidding. I'm sorry. <laughs> As I said that, I was like, not crazy often. Am I applying to do it more often? No, sorry, honey. I'm not saying that. But anyways, <clears throat> I can almost say it out loud. Like, man, Ross, you got a minute. This is going to be cool. Let's do our thing, right? See, this is a similar way in which this farmer is responding to this abundance of grain, this abundance of giving. But what does God say? In this way, he's practicing to store all these things up, to store what we call these temporary possessions. The Lord says this, You fool, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get all you prepared for yourself? Showing him the reality that what he's storing up is only for this time, for this moment. He can't take it with him beyond the grave. It's temporary. This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. Hmm. This parable, earthly story, with this heavenly, spiritual, applicable meaning for me and you, too. In the way in which we live and store up things in our lives, if we're only considering ourselves, and God's not our first priority, He's not there. We haven't considered that or chosen that. We've yet put him to second, third, fourth, maybe even fifth, tenth, maybe not even on the list yet. You should be concerned. And yet, we walk to fulfill ourselves. You fool. John Piper says this really uniquely, this illustration to helping us understand what rich towards God means in this passage. He's saying being rich towards God does not mean to enrich God. Simply put, he's not saying, you know, you should give me all your money. I mean, yes, yeah, sure, we need to give money to God. Let it be something that blesses his church, his people, all of that. But God doesn't need our riches. He doesn't need our money in the way that we think. Like, God's not sitting there and being like, hey, I really need you to give me five bucks so I can, like, do this other thing. He's like, no, I'm God. I can do anything and whatever I find pleasing and for my will. But when it looks to not enrich God, but to be rich towards God, is to count God as your riches. Count your relationship with God as your riches. And if you're looking for where to be rich, focus on God. Fully on Him, first and foremost. So laying up your treasures in heaven is maximizing God as your treasure. And all else will be. All else will flow from that as your treasure. So, so simply put, handle your money in a way that shows that God is your treasure, that He is the one you are treasuring, that He is the one in which is first on your to-do list of seeking, that He is the one who is in command of your riches, of your treasure, of what you have. And oftentimes, our script is flipped, kind of like this farmer. We inherit so much. We have all these things, and we can be materialistic. Our culture begs for us to be that way. You know, you get in your email, and I delete like 20,000 emails at a time. Yeah, for you, just click delete. I'm like, these all emails, all they say is get more stuff. Buy more things. Okay, I, I, you know, we, we own a house in, in Dubuque, and th thank God for that. And through that process, like other lenders say like, do you want to buy another house? And I'm like, for what? I, I can't even afford, I can barely afford this house, you know? They must know that, that I, but maybe they don't. I don't know. All of that, like, do you want more? Do you want more? Do you want more? 
And yet we can soak all that in and take it all in like grain in our barns if we don't stop to think, is Jesus really his kingdom, his way, his will, his rule, command, really the first in my life for me to do that? I think in the temporary things, quickly of our kids' toys, and how if you think of how we may purchase a toy or get gifted a toy for our kids, I'm not thinking for that thing to last forever. Like naturally with the way in which my kids are growing up, I'm thinking very temporarily of that toy. And it better be, we need to get those toys out of the house, okay? I'm ready, you know, there's, there's toys everywhere. I'm like, let's throw them all away. Let's just be toyless, I don't know. But in those toys, I'm thinking temporary because I'm only thinking they'll play with them until I don't really know. Is it like 10, 13, 12? Hopefully no more than that, I don't really know. Years old, right? And so I'm thinking very temporarily of this toy. And I'm like, one day it will go and it's gonna be okay. So we're gonna take care of it. We're not gonna like destroy it on purpose. Not like that Toy Story evil kid, you know, that's destroying all the toys. Like don't go to that toy land, you know, all that kind of thing. But we're gonna take care of it. We're gonna be all right. Maybe we give it off to someone else after. Let's do that, that'd be great. But I'm thinking temporary for our possession. And almost in that similar way, we need to begin to view our finances and our way in which we have our possessions on earth in the same way. We, we see this stark reality when some of our loved ones pass away, and we recognize that they are only inheriting a kingdom which doesn't take any of the possessions they have on earth. And we get to celebrate and, and, and be encouraged that they're dancing with Jesus, having a great time with the Lord, and we can only, like, we can't even imagine what truly heaven is like, but we like to use those words like things we think are fun now, which is going to be way better when we go. But in this reality, to think of our possessions, our materials, like this temporary feature that we're able to submit and use for the goodness of God, which shows that he's our, our greatest treasure, that our relationship with him is our greatest treasure, not these treasures we accumulated on earth. See, at the end of the day, God's not gonna, you're not gonna enter into the gates of heaven and he's gonna be like, hey, your bank account was so big, you can afford this, your balance is swapped over. It's like the, and it came in on a better rate. Like, good job, you know, Jesus isn't gonna say that. He's not gonna say, remember all that stuff you bought for that house? Like, funny enough, it just gets transferred to this house that you're in here in heaven. Like, good job, you like cashed in. It's not gonna say that. And say, no, no, those possessions you had, those things that I blessed you with, man, my prayer is that he would say before me, God, or, Ross, you honored me with those things I blessed you with. You, you honored me with those things. You didn't allow them to control you. You, by being under my shepherding, by being under my rule, command and way, you allowed them to be tools for me to use through you. And this is that idea of treasures in which, in reality, in our, in our culture today, and in this United States we live in that is richer than, than many, we can wrestle with, struggle with, but yet Jesus calls us to live generously. Point number two, if you're taking notes with us, is live generously. We see here in Matthew 6, 22, this illustration that Jesus begins to walk us through, which is interesting if you read it, I'll read it to you right now. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And I love how Jesus is so direct in his phrasing here. Like he's, he's kind of helping explain what he's saying. You can't serve two masters, you can't serve this. He just comes out and says it. You, you can't serve God and money. They're counter to the approach of service and, and what they're asking you to do. You've got to serve one or the other. There's no shared servanthood in this way. On, on your list, right, we're thinking through that. Like there's no like, they're both first. It's like, you got to serve me first, or sadly, you're going to choose your money first. And funny enough, Jesus teaches on money way more than sex or, or many other things because he realizes the, how money can capture us and begin to command us and rule over us in the way in which we live. You can't serve both. And he uses this illustration of the light of the eye, and you think how an eye works, and, 
as you're looking at me, and the reason you can see me is how your, light, uh, how, how your eyes taking in light to see things before you. So if this room went completely dark, which I was going to test that out, but we're not going to do it. If it went completely dark, you wouldn't be able to see. You would have a hard time. You'd stumble through the room. But yet when it's bright or light, you're able to see me. You see what I'm doing, how I'm talking. You see your friends next to you, your family members, all that. In this illustration, what, what Jesus is pointing out, and it's smack dab in the middle of this money talk. And what he's really pointing out when it comes to the eye it is also illustrated throughout Scripture. If we had time, we could dig into it. But with it, within this eye specifically, is if your eye is healthy, then you're, you live generously. If your eye is healthy, you're, you have generosity within your lifestyle and your way. You're, you're then having, seeking him first and generously living with the things he's given you. But yet, if your eye is unhealthy, if it's dark, and that darkness, he says, is so dark, fills the body dark, then you're living a life of greed. If your eye is healthy, it, it's this generosity, generous in the way we live. Unhealthy is greedy in the way we live. And I'm, I'm not even shocked that we see this light and dark complexion when it comes to our money, because we can't serve both equally. It's gotta be one or the other, so light or dark. But yet, when it comes to greed and, and the idea that it's darkness, because naturally, and most effectively, greed blinds us. Greed blinds us so severely. In, in my years of a student ministry, of even the last many months in the senior pastor role here at Hope Church, I have never, ever had someone come up to me. They come and share all these struggles we're having. I wrestle with pride, this, that, or the other. I need prayer for this, that. No one has ever come to me and said, listen, I'm struggling with greed, materialism. I'm struggling with, like, that. Can you help me? And it's not like they got to come to me for help. I want them to go to Jesus for this help, but it's like no one's ever even hinted towards greed. Why? Because greed's blinding to us. It's hard for us to see it and to recognize it. And you know what a, a common symptom of greed is? Is when, you hear, when you're asked the question, hey, would you, do you wrestle with greed? And your instant reaction is no, that, no way, not me. Well, that's a clear symptom that there might be something there that you're wrestling with greed. You're wrestling with storing of yourself things, treasures on earth, and not living generously in the way God has asked you. When we're quick and our hearts begin to get tense and you have that, that lump in your, ne in your neck and your throat and you're like, do I wrestle with greed? Lord, give me light to see if I do. Give me peace to know if I'm not. But oftentimes we may fall into understanding we do. We must be watchful in the way in which greed blinds us. And it blinds us in such a cultural, contextual way too. Because in our relationships outside of here, in the world today, greed is, is number one. You've got to get what you can get. You've got to take it all in. It's never enough. You've always got to have more. And we see greed even to the uh, deepest extent of hurting others, of foregoing care for other people, of I'm just, I'm, you know, I'm maybe owner of a business, I'm gonna just cut wages, you know, the bottom man, it'll, whatever, they can get minimum wage, which is still like 750. They're not livable, right? And greed says, I need to make my dollar for what my reward is in owning this business, and I don't really care what is below that. See, that's greed replicating itself and showing itself to harm others. Or maybe even in your neighborhood, in the way that you could care and, and shepherd others towards Christ around your neighborhood. But when money comes up, you're like, ah, oh, I, don't, I don't know. I think I really blessed them, but I got to own my stuff. They can't, I don't want to, begins to harm those relationships when money's brought in. Greed can often blind us and must be watchful, for none of us can serve two masters. We can't serve both God and money. He must reign supreme, and he commands it to be. Seek him first, and below that, below that, may you serve him with the way in which you treasure him with your money. Treasure him with your possessions. Treasure him with all you have. Point number three, trusting God with everything. 
We see this, this next section in <clears throat> Matthew 6, 25, going through this idea of anxiety and worry, and the reality which we live that we are full of anxiety and worry in our lives today. And the question that always arises, is anxiety and worry like a sin? And yes, deep down if you think of it, anxiety and worry is lacking a trust or an unbelief in what God's doing, what he's, what he's up to, what he's, how you can entrust him with your life. And so certainly, yes, by blatant unbelief, disbelief, and worry and anxiety, it causes sinful pattern in our life. But yet, if you could understand in this war in which worry and anxiety exist, and it's your mind. And I love the scripture we'll, we'll walk through in a moment, uh, illuminates the reality of our mind. But here in this next section, we see these points where Jesus begins to illuminate and show us how God is so good because he loves his kids so well that he provides through everything. So thus, why should we worry? Matthew 6, 25 through 34, we see God will take care of our food, right? Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you'll eat or what you drink or what your body or, or about your body, what you wear. Is not life more important than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds in the air. So we see this imagery. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? I love these like rhetorical questions. For those of us who follow Jesus, our instant answer is like, yeah, we, we are. I, I'm, I'm a son, a daughter of the king. By absolute, we are created in his nature, his image, much more valuable than any creation. Would he not provide for the way he does with other creation to you, his son or daughter? God will take care of our lives, Matthew 6, 27. Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And some of us, maybe even me, need to plaster this all over our, our rooms and our homes and on our phones. Because oftentimes we come to this realization that can worrying or, or anxiety towards whatever's happening in our, in our life today add a single hour. And Scripture tells us that, that God has counted our days. He's counted our time. He knows when our end will be, when we'll be in unique unity with Him in heaven. He knows in the way in which we'll live our life. He, he has the all-knowing, all-powerful. That's who He is. And so He knows our days. And so He's like, is there, like, I'm, your worry and anxiety isn't going to add an hour or a day to that reality. So can you add? No. Another rhetorical question. God will take care of everything, even our clothing, Matthew 6, 28. And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? Not labor or spin, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? It's reality that God clothes everything and will certainly clothe you. And we, in our culture today, clothes are pretty required, mandatory. You think of like those signs when you walk into establishments, like no shoes, no shirt, no service. Are those still a thing? I haven't seen them very often. Maybe we just know. It's... So clothes, we often have abundance of possession of clothes. But when it comes to the reality here, and, and the Hebrews at the time living in Israel, they would had so little money that buying clothes was so difficult. They would use it on anything else essential and clothes would be last on the list to be able to use money for. And so they lacked clothes, very evidently. And Jesus, in this reality, I will take care of that. I will clothe you with, with, with sure, physical clothes, with righteousness before God. Just let me take care of that. God will take care of all our needs in our future. So don't worry saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. So in this, in this mind reality of anxiety and worry, it's often shifting our perspective to understanding God knows our very, very need. Even in the most time of need, he knows it. And yet if we see he's a good God, loving God, one to provide it, maybe not in the way you want it, maybe not in the way you desire it to come, but trusting he'll provide it, that's the mental mind shift and casting our anxieties on him. Within this war we wage in our mind of anxious thoughts and worry, we find in Scripture this weapon to fight with. 
Philippians 4, 6 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Let us note that God doesn't say, Bring your request, and I'll just give you everything you want. Bring your request, and whatever you want, you got it. Lord, I want a bigger house. Okay, he doesn't say that. Lord, I want more of this, more of that. Doesn't say that. But what does he say? Bring your requests to me by prayer and petition, thanksgiving. Present them to me, and I will give you what? Peace, which transcends all understanding that we know, and will guard what? Our hearts and our minds. Have you tried to turn to God and your worries and anxieties to, to, to see if he gives you peace? To see if he guards your heart and your mind? And I, I'm not saying like, like, if you have, you're like, this just doesn't work, Ross, or maybe you haven't tried and you're like, I'm just not calculating that'll work. Would you try and maybe get back to me? Try for a week. Say, what does the scripture say? Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything. So try in everything that you face this week and try to find maybe where you, you're feeling anxious or nervous or worrisome, and stop and submit, submit the request to God. God, I'm worried about this, X, Y, Z, whatever, and I'm presenting it to you, to you God. Um, I need your help with this. I, uh, could you provide in this way? I, I need this. Um, would you just help me, God? And see what he would do in giving you peace that transcends all understanding and guarding your heart and mind. I know this is an area specifically for me that I need to grow in that I face every day moments where I can rise to worry and anxious thought, but yet must stop and step back and say, God, I don't want to struggle with unbelief that you're not going to provide, but yet step into belief that you will. I need the peace in which you give me to trust you through this because you're trustworthy with everything, with anything, in all things. So what for us have you committed your loyalty allegiance to God first and foremost in your life that everything else could flow from it? Your treasures, your possessions, yet also your worries, what you're anxious over. Have you allowed God to direct your generosity? That in your life today, you've said, God, I have these things which are blessings from you, and yet would you direct the ways in which I give them for you? in which I show the world in which I have treasure in you above everything, that I direct my generosity to the world around me because of it? Are you handling your money in such a way to show that God is truly your treasure? And at the end of the day, do you, do I, trust God with everything? With everything. Even the thing you pause and you're like, there's no way I can trust him with that. I know, I'm thinking that same way too. I, I'm with you. There's those little things that come up like, God, do I trust you with everything? Well, what's that? what about that one thing? What about, but do you? Do you trust God with everything? And when we understand Jesus was generous in his life, putting himself on a cross to die for our sins, to show that we are his treasure, we're able to step in and recognize, Jesus, you can be my treasure and by which I can give all to you and we can step into generosity. When we understand the power of God that raised Christ from the dead and gave us an inheritance of eternal life to come, that yet would we trust him to be all powerful in our everyday today? And can we trust him in every way today? The one who allows us inheritance in the kingdom to come, can we trust him in the moments of anxious thoughts, worries each and every day? So Jesus, I thank you. Father, I praise you for the ways in which you will teach and instruct us through your word. God, I ask that you would help us grow in a way in which it looks to be obediently, um, walking after you, uh, seeking after you. May each day we connect with you uniquely in your word. God, I pray for my friends who wrestle with worry and anxiety that they would uh, take steps with you, God, to use the greatest uh, battle sword in scripture to look to you and, and come to you with every little thing and that the promise is true that you will give us peace that surpasses understanding and guard our hearts and minds. God, would you help us step into that truth? And God, wherever it may be, would you call us to greater generosity which comes from you? 
God, I know we live in a time where money can be tight and the treasures we have, we feel we need to store up. But God, would you show us like the man inheriting tons of grain, ways we need to step out and let go and let you direct our generosity, let you direct our possessions because you, God, we seek you first. And we thank you for that ability to seek you first. God, we praise you and thank you again for this morning.